Public dialogue and civic engagement are important. They play a role in improving the health and well-being of Texans across our great state. That's why Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas is proud to support Texas Tribune events like the conversation you're about to see. Well, President, I want to thank you so much for having us here in, in Temple today. I want to apologize for my uh, bout with allergies. I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room who's wrestling with the weather today, but we're going to make it work. We're going to have a great event, and we're so happy to uh, be on this campus. I want to acknowledge not only uh, Dr. Barron, but Judy Danalek and Steve Lemons of the Temple College staff. These events don't happen on their own. People work hard to make it possible. And they were not only hospitable, but they worked alongside the Texas Tribune to make this event happen. Please give them all a very big applause. Um, let me say a word or two about the logistics of this event and then acknowledge a couple of people who additionally made it possible for us to be here. Then we'll introduce our guests and get started. If you have cell phones, I ask that you turn them to silent, if not outright off. If you can bear to turn them off, that's probably best. We're live streaming this event in addition to having you all here in the room so people are watching from all over Temple and Bell County and all over the state. And so out of respect for them, please turn your phones to silent at a minimum. If you tweet this event, the hashtag is TT events. We're going to talk up here for about 35 or 40 minutes. <clears throat> then we'll open it up for questions from any of you who want to line up behind the microphones on either side of the front here, and we'll take as many questions as possible. We will end promptly at one o'clock out of respect for you, out of respect for our guests. I know that uh, Dr. Buckingham, for instance, has to be at Fort Hood, and so we need to leave immediately at one o'clock. So we're going to end on time. If we don't get to your question, uh, I apologize. You may know the, the Tribune is a nonprofit, nonpartisan digital news organization, texastribune.org. We do three things, news data and events on public policy and politics. The events that we do are all over the state. We do more than 50 events a year, on average one per week, and many on college campuses like this one. And to Dr. Barron's point about the community colleges being at the center of the conversation in Texas, we have been to Amarillo College this year. We're going to be to Howard College in San Angelo and then Odessa College after that. We want to do events on uh, ca the campuses of what are effectively the public squares of this community. There is no greater public square in Temple than Temple College. So it's important to do this event and to bring you all here. And what a wonderful turnout we have today. Thank you all so much for coming. It's a uh, last thing I'll say is this is a free event. It is free to attend. It is important that we have free events at which elected officials interact with people who represent them. It is important for you all to hear from them. And to hear about the work that they're going to be doing on your behalf at the Capitol in this session and in the years to come. We allow this event to be free by getting uh, sponsors to make it possible for us to be here. And let me acknowledge Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, Old Castle Materials, Encore State Farm, AT&T, BP, PepsiCo, Walmart, Southwest Airlines, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation, and our media partner, the Temple Telegram, for making it possible for all of us to be here for free to provide your lunch. Please give them a big hand. And with that, let me uh, introduce our distinguished guests, the lawmakers elect. I think this is the first time we've done an event with only lawmakers elect. So I have to be careful how I refer to them. That's historic. Right, who've joined us here today. On my left is Don Buckingham, Republican of Lakeway, who was elected on November 8th to represent Senate District 24, succeeding the retiring Troy Frazier. Now, we worked this language out right beforehand, so I want to be sure I have it right. She is the first Republican elected from Travis County in the Texas end. Is that right? Is that right? I had to get the prepositions right. I am a journalist. The words actually matter. From, from. She is a seventh generation Texan who spent her adolescent years in Austin. She has an undergraduate degree from the University of Texas at Austin and a medical degree from the UT Medical Branch in Galveston. An oculoplastic and reconstructive surgeon, she's an ophthalmologist and a partner at a central Texas practice, Eye Physicians of Austin. She previously served on the Lake Travis Independent School District School Board, on the State Board of Educator Certification, and on the Sunset Commission. On her left is Hugh Shine, Republican of Temple, who was just elected to represent House District 55, having defeated incumbent Molly White in the March Republican primary. But this is, of course, not his first time as a legislator. Three decades ago, he served two terms in the Texas House. At that time, he was the first Republican to represent Bell County 
at the Capitol since the Civil War. One thing you'll notice that's different, there are a few more Republicans in Thank Austin. Thank goodness. A couple more. <laughs> Thank goodness. He's both a veteran financial advisor and an actual veteran, retired with the rank of Colonel from the U.S. Army after commanding the 49th Armored Division's Aviation Brigade. He was raised in Navasota. He has an undergraduate degree from Sam Houston State University and an MBA from Baylor University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Don Buckingham and Colonel Hugh Schein. Good, uh, good to be with you both. Um, uh, so we're exactly on Dece as we sit here on December 8th, we're exactly one month out from the, from the election, from election day. Um, we may not have known that Donald Trump would win. We did know that the two of you would win. One of the blessings <laughs> of redistricting, maybe the only blessing, is that we know the outcome of elections before they happen. I want to talk about the 85th session, but I do want to ask each of you, given the fact that we're still so close to the election, to reflect on what you believe at the presidential level the election of Donald Trump means. What is the takeaway? What's the message to all of us as we're considering the world going forward, and how does it impact your view of Texas. Dr. Buckingham first. Well, you know, I really think that Donald Trump changes a complete dialogue in the state of Texas. You know, finally we have an ally on border, our border security, which is one of the number one issues in the state. Um, and also in health care. You know, we filed Senate Resolution Number 1, which was to support our congressional delegation so that they would abolish, abolish Obamacare. And so we're excited to work through that with the Republican leadership. And I just think it changes a lot of the dialogue. Instead of thinking about funding a whole bunch more money down at the border, we're going to be able to hopefully back off of that a little bit, let the federal government do what it should be doing in the first place, and then we can turn our attention to the needs of the state, which is where our attention should be. Uh, Colonel Shine, Dr. Buckingham is, is absolutely true in this respect that a legislative session playing out against the backdrop of a Clinton administration would have been very different than a legislative session playing out against the backdrop of a Trump administration. How does, what, what is the meaningful message to take away from this? I think the meaningful message is that uh, folks were mad at yep. the administration. Yep. They were also mad at Republican House members uh, and senators because Obama told folks that he was going to rule with a pen and a cell phone. And for the average working person, that was a very arrogant statement. And there was an anger, too, from the, from the folks about the, the Congress because they felt that the Congress needed to stand up to that, and they didn't do it to their like, like so to speak. Now, granted, there probably wasn't very much they could do. Yeah. But the fact that they didn't stand up made them mad. So, so they, they wanted they somebody. They rejected the establishment. They, until they rejected it. Until and they wanted someone. Yeah. That, rep, that they felt would go there and just turn the whole place upside down. Right. And Donald Trump represented that. In fact, talking with some of these guys, uh, they felt like he would be the guy that would throw a hand grenade into Washington, D.C., blow it up, right. change it, and they were okay with that. Right. And that's going to translate for us, as the senator mentioned, from anything from border security to right. a number of other issues that we may be facing in Texas that we may not have to face depending on how he uh, right. as, as, as a result, well, I'm gonna, uh, you've been enormously helpful in providing me this transition because, in fact, I want to talk <laughs> about border security first. You know, you're both entering this legislature. You were not there last time. You were not part of the vote cast to ultimately approve $800 million in border security spending in the current budget year. In advance of this election, the Department of Public Safety was already talking about requesting not only another 800, but as much as a couple hundred million more than that. This is going to be a very tight budget year, as we'll talk about, because of the oil and gas economy in the state of Texas. So it was going to be tough to free up those dollars anyway. But now that you have Donald Trump in the White House, and now suddenly, not the federal government you did not like, but a federal government you presumably will like a lot more is going to be responsible for this issue. Can't you, Dr. Shine, just say we're not going to spend anything on border security? We're just going to let the federal government take care of it and do its job, since that's what you said they should have been doing in the first place. You want me to answer that one? I do. Dr. Shine. Dr. Shine. What did I say, Dr. Colonel, Shine? Colonel Buckingham. Colonel Buckingham, we're good. We're, we're going to switch roles here. I was this close. <laughs> I got it. I Colonel, got it. Colonel Shine. That's all right. Don't you want to take that number down to zero or near zero now that the feds are going to do what you say they should have been doing to begin with? Well, absolutely, because it is a federal responsibility. We yep. all know that. But because the federal government has failed to do what it was supposed to do, Texas stood up and said, we can't do this anymore. Yep. It was impacting us on social issues. 
uh, impacting our schools and also our criminal justice system. Because the dollars spent on border security were not dollars spent on something exactly. else. Exactly. Right. Now, I don't think this is going to be a, a quick change just yeah. be, once he's sworn in. You have to understand that the budget that the Congress is going to be working under is a budget that they've already right. somewhat passed. So we may not see any resolve on this until the next uh, two years. So we need to be prepared to continue to do what we're doing, I believe, until that happens. And here's why. Yeah. We saw what happened when we were in Iraq and we pulled everybody out and now we have a real problem internationally. And I don't want to really get into federal issues, but this is kind of a parallel. So we pull out and we negate continuing with what we were doing yeah. and we end up with a problem. If we do the same thing on the border and pull out before the federal government steps in and does their, takes on their responsibility, we're got, we can have the same problem. I looked at numbers last week from the, from the uh, uh, House uh, Homeland Security. I have been on the border. A lot of y'all know, and I've shared with this before, in my National Guard career from 1987 until I retired in 04, I was responsible as a commander of deploying National Guard soldiers in helicopters all across the state of Texas. We were interdicting drugs and we were providing border uh, support to law enforcement. I have flown the entire border from El Paso to Brownsville, from Brownsville to the Louisiana border up to Texarkana and have been personally involved in all of that. I flew with my pilots. I got to go back this past summer and I sat through the briefings that our DPS people are doing, bringing all of the agencies, the law enforcement agencies together, talking about what's working, what's not working, how we can improve it, and we have become very efficient with what we're doing. So you, 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 believe, you believe that this has been a good exercise to this? I think it's a good exercise because yeah. I went down the river right. with, the, with the parks and lava. I spent time on the river. I went out there in the boats with the swift boats with DPS. And I also had the privilege of flying the helicopter that DPS has yeah. from Lake, uh, uh, from Falcon Lake down to Brownsville on a right. regular mission, right. using the FLIR system that we've been using, and it works. And I've got statistics if we want to get into well, it, the, the, the success the, the, we've had. The, but the overall point is you would not pull back that spending no, to zero or near, even near that in the short term. Exactly. Right. Dr. Buckingham, you alluded to the fact that we're going to spend less. I mean, I have to believe that they're going to at least try to spend less, given the needs that... Colonel Shine talked about public education, health care, and on and on, right? Well, I think while the federal government's coming on board with actually securing our border, which, as Representative-elect Shine said earlier, is one of their primary responsibilities, and we're going to have to fill that gap. So we just want to be sure, kind of yeah. like we're doing in our offices now, we just want to be sure that baton is passed cleanly and yep. that our state is protected like it needs to be. I would right. anticipate, uh, my understanding is DPS is going to withdraw their request for extra money at this point. Um, they're going to come in at the 800 million. I would anticipate um, we come in at slightly less than that right. with with the tough budget but cycle. But we'll, we'll have, see. We'll, we'll but I don't, have to I don't see. think it's like a faucet. I don't think you can turn it off tomorrow. You know, you mentioned that, and in fact, I think that's a, a reasonable point that it's going to take a little while for the new administration to get in and do what it does before we can react to it. And healthcare, in many respects, Dr. Buckingham, a subject you know very well, is a similar deal. Um, we heard a lot about repeal and replace during the. Uh, the primary and the general election, but the reality is as much as the president-elect may want on day one to just knock the thing out, it's really hard to take something as large as the Affordable Care Act and dismantle it all on day one, right? No. So you're just going <laughs> to... So hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're going to... I, I know what you... you yeah, yeah, I know what you want to do. <laughs> but the reality is that over the last, over the last uh, six and a half years as while well, the Affordable Care Act has been in effect, as much as you may not like it, an awful lot of people have become... Uh, have been put on health insurance and didn't have it before. Are you advocating knocking those people off without a replacement, or do you want to wait for something to replace it so that, again, it's a seamless handing of the baton? Well, a couple, couple points on that. One, you know, so many of the people on the exchanges are on the exchanges because the health plans that they liked and the doctors that they liked um, were made illegal by Obamacare and they were shoved onto the exchanges, so they had insurance before. Um, I can tell you what I see in my practice every day, and there are individuals who have benefited, and, and we want to figure out how to how to bridge those challenges. Yeah. Um, but you know what I'm seeing is people with fifteen thousand dollar deductibles who can't afford their deductible and monthly um, premiums that they can't afford either. So I think we have a long way to go. I think Obamacare, between the failed promises of you get to keep your doctor, which you didn't, and insurance rates weren't going to go up, which I can tell you mine personally more than doubled. 
uh, we start rapidly dismantling that and your premiums get back down to where they need to be and all of a sudden insurance is a lot more affordable right and finally insurance is not access to care there are a lot of people who have health insurance who go into bankruptcy because of medical bills. And so at some point we have to realize right. that it's not one in the same. Well, there are also not enough care. doctors in the state of Texas. It's not just a coverage problem, but it's also do we have enough, enough medical professionals? Right. You know, with an aging population who needs more care. Although I will say that because of our tort reform, we have thousands of more doctors coming into the state right. every year. And we're bridging a lot of those gaps. We're also working on training more students in medical schools. We worked last time on GME funding additionally, yeah. and so we, we still have progress to that, but yes, we have a gap. Now, the, the, the discussion in Washington, Dr. Buckingham, before I go to Colonel Shine, is that possibly the Congress would come in in January and vote to repeal, but delay the repeal until they actually had a replacement. Your future colleague, Dr. Donna Campbell, and I talked last Friday, and her response was, nope, I would not wait until a replacement. I would just go ahead and repeal right now. The private sector will rush in, we'll figure something out, but basically we don't need to delay until we have a replacement. Where do you come down on that? Yeah, I, I agree with Senator Campbell. I yeah. think for the most part, I mean, you buy your insurance for basically a year, so you have some time there anyway. But I think that the private market will step in and, and make right. affordable plans, and I think it'll be a lot easier to make affordable plans with, outside of the confines of Obamacare, as we know uh, Colonel Shine, it's difficult to take away something from people that they've come uh, to, to expect or that they've gotten used to or that they like. And while the Affordable Care Act may be broken, people can argue about that. The reality is there are a number of aspects of it that people actually like. They like not having pre-existing conditions be a kill card when they go to get insurance. They like being able to kill, to keep their 26-year-old on their insurance plan at home until that, in, in, in that extra year. So what do you do for the people who have gotten insurance over these last number of years and who might like aspects of this system, even if it's not perfect? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a very difficult question to answer, yeah. first off, but I believe as senator does that we should do move as quickly as we can and i do believe in the private sector i think the private sector will step in very quickly yeah. and and move forward with something that will work and I, and and they're already talking in washington about keeping some of the provisions that are good provisions that's right. like you're we're talking about and move forward to try to make it more affordable and get rid of some of the imp provisions right. that people don't like. But you wouldn't and, wait. You would not no, wait I would until not wait there's either. a full-blown I mean, plan. But I would also defer to those who right. are more in tune with that profession right. to make some of those decisions right. and discuss that with them right. and be a lead for them on the House side. If, right. if this were a state issue, we're really talking a federal issue more than anything yeah. else. Let me ask you a snotty journalist question. This is not the only one I'm going to ask today, but let me advertise it as Do my first. Do we need first. a Kleenex? Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, the, re the reality is that the state of Texas has said for some time, just give us that money back that, that you all are spending on this. Basically, block grant the money back. We'll solve the problem. You all had the opportunity before the Affordable Care Act went into effect in March six years ago to solve the problem. And the state of Texas has not solved the problem, did not solve the problem. My question is, we understand what you're opposed to. Can you give us a sense of, of what you all would do if you got that money back? Because I, I have no indication that the state has a plan in place right now. Dr. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Chairman Charles Schwartner, who's just from, from just south of here in, right. in Georgetown. Like you, a doctor. Yeah, like me. I'm not, we were in medical school together, so I've known him a long time. But yeah. he's actively reaching out. For the first time, we actually have a physician in Tom Price, um, who's head of health and human services at the federal level. level. And so we're going to be working together to come up with a block grant. And I think, again, we can have conversations we couldn't have before. Also with the 1115 waivers, I mean, that's probably something y'all don't follow very much, but the federal government was basically saying, Texas, we're going to say no to your waivers, which were costing some of our hospitals upwards of $38 million a year. And they were just saying, heck no, we're going to punish you until you do what we want, how we want you to do it. Right. And so now, again, we have a friend instead of a foe in the White House, and we can have conversations and actually get down to delivering the care that people so need. So you, you feel like there would be a plan in place relatively quickly if you got that money back? It, I will tell you it's actively being formulated now. You're satisfied with that? All right. Um, Colonel Shine, so, so health care is right now 37% of the all funds budget in the state of Texas. It's cost of health care in Texas has risen dramatically to the point that for the first time in the history of the state, we're now spending as much on health care as education. And health care is obviously a very big deal, but education continues to be a big deal. One of the challenges you're going to face uh, when you go back in in January is what to do about the, the a system of funding public education. Uh, I, I don't know if 30 years ago 
the public school system was in litigation, but it seemed to be in litigation for as long as anybody can remember. It's it kind of was a bit, in litigation. Yeah, it's, it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> We have a system in place, the school districts don't like it, they sue, the courts find some version of it to be inadequate, legislature comes back in and redoes it. You are being handed by the state Supreme Court the task again of figuring out what the right way to approach um, school finance is. We have a fast growing population, right? 85,000 kids being added to the public school system in the state of Texas every year. What's the right answer here? Do we need more money in the public schools? How should we think about this? I think that the uh leadership in the house is already looking and studying that i have visited with every school superintendent in house district 55. one of the first things i did after i was elected yep. is made a tour of the entire district and some of those superintendents are here today i have extended myself to them to yep. listen to them i've met with their finance officers to talk about in fact, uh, uh, jokingly i went in with my laptop computer and a flash drive and excel loaded up uh, with the idea that I was going to spend a few hours at TISD with the finance officer and come back with a spreadsheet that uh, I could work on to, to say, okay, here's what we need to try to do. After about three hours, I walked away and I looked at uh, Mr. Boyd and I said, you can't build a spreadsheet on public school finance. Yeah, it's and very, he looked at me and grinned and said, it's yeah. very complicated, folks. Uh, All your superintendents tell you they want more money? I'd be shocked if they didn't. Well, not just superintendents. Every agency in the state wants more money. Right. Okay. Where does, where does that money need to go? It needs to go to our priorities. And is, is education this, is, this is, this a priority. Priority. Well, so is a priority. You know, you know, Colonel Shine, again, back 30 years ago, this may have been said. It's certainly said now. There are an awful lot of people who believe that money is not the answer to making our public school system better. People assume that if you simply spend more, that performance will improve, well, but there are all quick, kinds of data that say that's not the case. Let me give you a quick point. I, yep. There's a recent article that's out about uh, increased spending in pre-K, and looking at that, uh, the results of that, by the ch time the children reach third grade, they improved their test scores by 40%. So there is data that's available to show that making some changes in the public education process yep. does turn out a better prepared student. Uh, one that's ready to go to whether it's the junior colleges uh, yep. the, that we have in our communities or higher education yep. to our four-year universities, or if they choose to go to vocational schools so and have sounds, an associate Colonel, degree. it sounds like you just voted yes on greater funding for pre-K. No, but I will say this. I definitely believe... <laughs> we are, we are recording this. I you understand know that. that. <laughs> you know, yeah. I do believe that when you look at those that kind of data, it gives you the, uh, the strength to say, we yeah. need to look at the changes that are making a difference in our kids' lives, okay? And that's the important so point. So you're willing, I, I guess the point is you're willing to entertain the idea Absolutely. that more money may be necessary. It needs to be a dialogue. Uh, Dr. Buckingham, I've talked to a lot of people in the Senate who, when I ask them flatly, do you think we ought to put more money in education? The answer comes back, no. Where are you on this? Well, you know, just so y'all know my background, um, I've served on my Lake Travis School Board. I've served on the State Board of Educator Certification. You know, I understand why the public schools are so concerned heading into this legislative session. Yeah. And I understand what it's like to be on a school board and have a big deficit budget. We have a lot of uh, problems with WADA, which is your weighted average daily attendance. I mean, let's face it, you have to be set up to teach 100% of your students. But the bottom line is, maybe 85% of your students show up every day, so you only get paid for 85% of your students, not the 100 you have to be ready to teach. So there's also a lot of schools that are losing something called losing their ACETAR. Um, and so that was kind of the, some of the gap funding that the state kind of put in after the cuts in 2011. And, um, and those are some big deficit numbers. But the bottom line is, in my opinion, we shackle our public schools and we give them all these regulations that they have to comply with that makes them spend less money proportionately in the classrooms and more money on big administrations. So I'm, I'm looking forward to partnering with our public schools and helping them reduce some of that red tape that costs them so much money so that the money can be focused in the classroom on the kids. Doesn't sound like you said though whether you think we should spend more money. You know, I, I think when you're coming into a tough budgetary cycle and you have something that's already a third of your budget, it's hard to come in and say we have a whole bunch more money to spend. What so do you do sure about, though, 85,000 new kids? The state's pop, you know, the budget may not be a very generous budget, but we're still adding all these people to the state's population a day. People are still coming to Texas. 85,000 more kids in the public education system one year ago, one, one year from now. So do you fund enrollment growth? 
well, money already follows the kid to a certain level in the state. I mean, you get paid a certain amount of money based on their average daily attendance per student. You get more money for students who are gifted. Right. Eng English is a second language. You know, so to an extent, the schools are already reimbursed by the students. Right. But but in, but in terms of, of new money for public ed, you're not prepared to say yes or no? Well, we just need to look at it and see what's going to serve our children the best. Right. You've alluded, Dr. Buckingham, a couple times to the budget. The reality is that the price of oil uh, today is about half of what it was two years ago. And while the budget cycle we're in was the largest budget in history of the state of Texas, none of us thinks that the budget is going to be anything like what it was last time. So you're going to have to spend, let's just pick a number out of the year, you're going to have to spend $4 billion less or $5 billion less as a state overall on the priorities of this fast growing and dynamically changing state. What would you not spend money on this time that you spent money on last time? Well, what I said consistently through the campaign, and I still believe this, is that there are ways to save and create efficiencies across the system that result in big savings. Um, for example, any time I've ever been really associated with any kind of a state-related department or any university system, they had a budget. And if you didn't spend all that money um, in that budgetary cycle, then you didn't get that money the next year. So it gets to be kind of toward the end of their fiscal year, and they start looking around for ways to spend that money to justify their money for the following year. I think Senator Creighton actually filed a really good bill that incentivizes people through carrots and says, hey, if you're not going to spend all your money this time, let's figure out a way to reward you for that. Let's be sure it'll be in the budget next time, but let's turn that money back for savings. And I really think it's the flood of raindrops. You know, you just, lots of savings all across the state, and all of a sudden you have a whole bunch more. So money. you think you can just tighten up here, there, and everywhere, and ultimately that's going to be the money you need? I think so. You know, uh, Colonel Shine, I've never known a lead safe session that didn't end with people in education, health care, transportation who had their hands out and were disappointed. How are you going to tell those people no? And which people specifically are you going to tell them? No? What are you not going to spend money on? Well, I want to go back to a question you asked a moment ago. And then rather than talking about where we're spending, we first need to grow the revenues. And here's what we need to do. Texas has been very successful in growing the economy. We are a shining star among the 50 states economically of growing the economy in Texas. And what we have done over the last 30 years since I was there before, we have been very successful in diversifying the Texas economy. We, when I was there before, we had a real problem because oil and gas constituted such a large part of the budget. It was 22% when you were there. Yeah, it's, it's now 14%. Today. Now 14%. Correct. And when you're talking about billions of dollars, that uh, additional 8% is a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. So we need to continue to put into place an environment that grows the economy. That means economic development at the municipal level as well as at the state level to grow the economy. We grow the economy, you increase the revenues that are there to meet the 85,000 that you're yeah. talking about that comes up. Can you be specific about what you have to do at the local level? This is not an issue without controversy. You know, there are people in colleagues, future colleagues of, of Dr. Buckingham's who say that the state should not be in the business of creating incentives for the purpose of growing. No, I disagree with that completely. You think we should? You, you Absolutely. Are, you are pro-incentive. Absolutely. Yeah. That's how communities survive. Tax, how, tax breaks, all the sort of things to you, attract business. I'm not going to use your term as tax breaks, but what, well, you, what put do you want to call place, it then? What well, is you it? put it into place, you put in a reinvestment zone, you put in economic development corporations and municipalities, yeah. and you allow those to function to go out and attract the business that meets the needs of their community, that brings in the kind of business that they want attracted in their community, that right. meets the workforce that they have, that is community oriented, okay? Uh, and I think those things are very effective. Yeah. Uh, communities need that. For, for example, in 1989, Abilene, the city of Abilene was on the verge of bankruptcy. On the verge of bankruptcy. And the Senate uh, had a piece of legislation for a res referendum for economic development on a half cent sales tax. When that was passed, the city of Abilene had a referendum election before that was passed. And the intent of that was for the purpose of the community to use that money exclusively for economic development. It saved Abilene. Yep from bankruptcy. They were the first city in the state to have a referendum to do that. Right, but, it was a, but that was a vote. That wasn't a decision by the local government to give tax dollars where, call them whatever they, you want, potato chips, I don't care what you call them, to give breaks to business to come to, to Abilene. The public voted on that. In that community, that's right. Right. 
So would you subject any economic incentives offered to businesses to locate in a place like Bell County that needs to be a to, local, a, to a public local vote? option decision? Local option. Um, you know, you're, you're the, the loudest, uh, Dr. Buckingham, the loudest person on this subject is your future colleague, Connie Burton from Fort Worth, who when presented with the opportunity to have Facebook come to her community and create jobs in her community in exchange for an economic incentive said, you know what, I believe that's corporate welfare. I oppose it even though it's in my community. What do you think about this? Dr. Shine, Colonel Shine seems comfortable with the idea of economic incentives. Are you comfortable with it? Well, I think, I think you have to look at the individual programs. You kind of, I kind of liken it to having a basket of apples. You've got some good apples in there that do great things for the communities, and you've got some, everyone can point to kind of some bad apples that the communities gave a bunch of tax abatements to, and that company didn't pull through with the jobs and the economic development that they anticipated. So again, you know, I'm a doctor. I look at best practices. You see what works. You see what helps your community. Um, I don't want to pick win winners and losers. I but think it doesn't sound like you're saying that. no incentives under any circumstances. I think you have to look at it and see what's reasonable for your community. Right. So in this, back to this question of the tightness of the budget, one of the things that happened in the last budget, which was, again, $209.4 billion over the biennium, the largest budget in the history of Texas, was almost $4 billion in tax relief out of that budget partly by rejiggering the property tax rates, homestead exemption, so that people got a modest property tax cut. The rest of it was reducing the business tax. Both the House and the Senate have said they want to come back and look at additional tax relief in the next budget. But it's a tighter budget. Can you afford Dr. Buckingham tax relief in what will be a smaller footprint budget this time? I think we can. You know, across the district, every day in this campaign, I talk to folks who are being taxed out of their homes, off their family property, couldn't hold on to their family ranches. And so we're here to fight and try and create less of a tax burden. <clears throat> Except the amount of money that people got back in tax relief, property tax relief, as a result of this last cut was like 126 bucks. It was a, not a, a significant amount of money. Was the juice worth the squeeze when you consider how much money you gave back in tax relief? You know, I think we passed the most conservative budget Texas has had. We passed the biggest tax breaks that we've had in the state that I know of. And so we're going to continue to look for ways to save you money, and we're going to continue to look for ways to right. shrink government and make it cost less. No regrets on that at all. Nope. Now, the public education system, Colonel Shine would say, you're taking with one hand and taking with the other. On the one hand, you're not adequately funding public education, but then you're reducing property tax rates, which in, in fact is like a second reduction of revenue available for public education. Can we really sustain all this under a tight budget? We have been underfunding public education for a long time. And we keep talking about the funding side. We need to start also looking at how we spend that money and where our efficiencies are. Right. Okay. Uh, again, uh, I, I, I can only think of an, an analogy. Okay. When you talk about how much money you have in government, if you plan a trip, that's a thousand mile trip based on what you want to do. <coughs> and another family member says, no, we really only want to make an 800 mile trip. And another family member says, no, we really only would do 500 mile trip. But you know what? We only have enough gasoline in the car to go 375 miles. So what are you going to do? So what you have to do is you have to think about yeah. the whole process both on the spending side and on the revenue side. I prefer to look at efficiencies on the spending side first, no matter what budget it is, whether it's education, yeah. whether it's human services, even law enforcement. That's where you have to look at it first. You fund the needs first, yeah. and if you funded all the needs and you have some money left over, then you look at the things that you want. So I'm going to take what you just said and interpret it. You tell me if this is right. So if we uh, don't adequately fund the priorities of the state, you think we can't afford tax cuts. Is that what you're saying? No, not That's necessarily. That's not what I heard. Well, what I heard, what I heard was, <laughs> what I heard was, you spend what you need to spend, and then you decide whether you've spent the amount that you need to spend before you do something else. What you've got to understand is 85% of the budget is driven constitutionally and statutorily and by dedication. We have discretion on 15% of the budget. A $200 billion budget means yeah. we get discretion on $30 billion. That's a tough, and that's only for public ed, higher ed, DPS, 
and uh, the fourth one is oh, criminal justice. But you're, Those but, are the only yeah, ones we have yeah, discretion yeah, on. Yeah, but again, come back to the tax question. Within the realm of discretion, you can decide how much you tax the business community. You've both been in the small business universe. You understand the import of the franchise tax, the margins tax, often called. 25% cut in the business tax last time. Both, both the House and Senate seem to be saying we're not going to eliminate it completely in this next session, but we're going to cut it back again. You think we should cut the business tax again? Uh, yes, if we can. It's an income tax. Yeah. The corporate franchise tax is nothing more than an it's income It's effectively tax. an income tax. I have opposed an income tax before. I'll oppose it again, and the corporate franchise tax is nothing more than a, a, a name on something that's really an income tax. But again, I want to reemphasize re yeah. that we need to look at the priorities on how we spend money at every level before we start talking about more money. Right. And uh, cut the business tax? Absolutely. Are you good with just with phasing it out, or you want to see it cut completely? Well, I, I think the reality is we're going to be phasing it out. Yeah, can't really do it all in one in one fell it, swoop. It, I think in this budget, it's hard to do it in one fell swoop. Okay. If there's a way to do it, I would love to. Let me ask you about immigration. Uh, we we talked about border security, but of course, in the bucket of issues related to immigration, there's going to be quite a bit more than just the the spend on border security. We are going to certainly have legislation to consider whether or not we should ban sanctuary cities in the state of Texas. This has been a topic of discussion at the Capitol for some time. Dr. Buckingham, will you support such a bill? I believe um, uh, Charles Perry from Lubbock is the one carrying the principal bill in the Senate. Governor Abbott has already said he would sign this bill. Is that one of your priorities in this session? Absolutely. You know, we have to realize that a lot of it is the draws that bring people here across our border illegally. And so we need to get rid of sanctuary cities and the other draws that bring people here. One of the other draws, we're on a campus that uh, educates people at the higher education level. One of the draws, it is sometimes said, um, is the opportunity for undocumented persons to pay in-state tuition rates at Texas uh, public universities. Um, th that has been the law since 2001 in Texas, and there have been a couple of attempts unsuccessful to, to overturn that law. Will you support an overturning of that law as an incentive of the sort you're talking about? I will. So you believe no more in-state tuition rates for undocumented students? I agree. Colonel Schein? I would agree with uh, the senator. You would also and, overturn and here, it. And here's the reason on the sanctuary city side. Yeah. If you have sanctuary cities, where are they going to migrate? Where are they going to, where, and that's going to cause, uh, and the <coughs> sanctuary cities are our large urban areas right. that already have problems, okay? So we're going to increase crime. We're going to also increase the effects on social services, health care, and education, and it creates more of a problem uh, across the state because, hey, we got a place that we can get into Texas right. where we're safe. More people are going to be coming across the border. You're going to make it more difficult for DPS and the Parks right. and Wildlife people and everybody else on the border. They're trying to seal the border or, or at least limit what's coming across, have their, a greater job to have to do. So to communities of color who say that if you ban sanctuary cities, you're opening the door to racial profiling, what's your response? We disagree with that. You disagree? I, yeah, I disagree Absolutely. with that too. We're talking about legality. We're talking about law. Mm -hmm. I mean... We're a nation, we're a con our country lives under a constitution. We have laws. And all of us in this room abide by those laws and live by those laws. Right. And to allow people to come into our country that feel like they don't have to obey the laws, that's ludicrous. You know, I live in a county where our sheriff, our current sheriff who got elected this time, campaigned on making Austin and Travis County a sanctuary city. The first official sanctuary city in Texas. And we need to get right. back to the rule of law, not the rule of man. Right. Okay, you don't get to pick and choose, especially when you're in law enforcement, the laws that you decide to obey. You know, if our laws aren't good, then let's change them. But we, right. we should be obeying and following the laws we have on the books. So on this question of what Travis County means to do on sanctuary cities, Dr. Buckingham, Colonel Shine, I want to ask you both about local control. We talked a lot about vertical issues, public education, health care, what have you. This is more of a horizontal issue. It goes across a lot of different subjects. I, I'm old enough to remember when local control meant the locals controlled things. I seem to remember that your party, the Republican Party, used to talk about local control all the time. And it seems like we've now come to a place where you all are for local control unless you don't like what and how the locals are controlling things. Help me understand how to think about this, especially since you don't like it when the federal government, Dr. Buckingham, tells the state of Texas what to do. Why is it okay for you to tell cities like Austin or counties like Bell County what to do? Because the sovereignty of the federal government comes from the states. The states have rights. The municipalities are don't have their independent sovereignty. They have the sovereignty that we give them. So you just went all civics textbook on me. 
It's a good answer. I mean, I'm, I'm looking for more of an emotional answer, and you decided to bring facts to the conversation. This is a problem. This is a problem. Facts okay. don't lie. No, it's a problem. I mean, I don't you know. So, so it, it is, in fact, an, an, an insufficient anal or an inaccurate analogy to say that what the federal government does to Texas is equivalent to what Texas does to the Correct. cities and counties. But can you understand, Colonel Schein, why the cities and counties or the school districts or hospital districts might chafe at being told what to do by the state? Can you understand why? I can understand why. That doesn't necessarily make it susceptible to change. Right. But I can understand why. I mean, there's, I mean, we can take that in a number of different settings where folks don't like what's <coughs> being decided. Right. But and they and they certainly have the right to ask why if they're not uh, in a situation where they just have to salute and say three bags full and go on about their business. Right. But uh, yeah. So so whether it's ride hailing ordinances or bag bans or fracking bans, if you're a county or a city, and you believe that you through the vote of your residents or just by the powers of municipal government intend to say we're going to go this way even though others are going that way they can expect the legislature to push back of course i mean we have as, as the senator mentioned we are a nation of laws not right. of men right. and that is what makes this great nation a great nation because we have laws we don't turn over our administration right. every 10 and 15 or 20 years with a coup we have the most peaceful transitions of power of any nation in the world when we change over the presidency or any other level of government, whether it's at our, our school boards or city councils right. or at the state level or at the federal level. And that's what makes this country such a great so, so the concept, let me just try one more time on this. So the concept that we hear often from the state of Texas with regard to how the federal government, I know, I know, I know, <laughs> that the federal government, one size fits all. We don't like cookie cutter approaches in our democracy. The counties might say the same thing back to you all. We don't like cookie cutter approach. You don't change law with by executive order. Right. Federal level, right. county level, doesn't, doesn't make a difference. That's what the Congress and the legislature's right. responsibility is, and changing law by executive order is wrong. Doesn't work. So let me encourage people to line up at these microphones to ask questions to these folks while I ask my last question to these guys. So another issue on local control that will come up, it's really not so much of an issue of local control only, is the question of bathroom access that is you know every every session has has one of these or a couple of these wild card issues that come up the lieutenant governor has made one of his big priorities what he calls the women's privacy act which would seek to regulate access to locker rooms restrooms and showers the transgender community feels targeted by this they say that opponents uh, or, or or supporters of this bill are posing a, a, a false threat, basically, that men want to go into women's restrooms or locker rooms, predators, when in fact this is simply about access by the transgender community to bathrooms of their choice. The Women's Privacy Act is, I think, the sixth priority on the Lieutenant Governor's list of 25 legislative priorities. Um, I wonder where each of you comes down on this. This is going to clearly be the big issue that is going to blow up uh, this this session is going to be a big topic of discussion so what do you think about that well i think we want to be sure that we don't have sexual predators being able to walk into the women's bathroom is that really what this is about i think so because what happened was obama <laughs> just flat out with his pen said if you're a man and you decide that you identify with a woman that day no one can stop you from walking in the women's bathroom and that's not okay you know the the transgender folks they've had the schools have been dealing with it. They've made accommodations that work for those kids. Um, but I think Obama took it to the next level when he did his declaration, or whatever you call him. And, um, and I think we have to stand up and, and be sure we protect it. I'll, I'll tell you, I hear a lot from parents who have daughters in our public schools. And they just flat out say, my child will not shower in a locker room that a man is in there. Um, so if, if, if President-elect Trump gets rid of the president's executive order on this, if he basically comes in and overturns that directive the way he overturns other directives, do we just go back to a situation where we go back to where we were? We don't need a law. We didn't have a law before. We don't need a law now. Well, we need to see, you know, how all that transpires. But, you know, we want to be sure that when women or girls are in the bathrooms that, that they feel safe. You're a vote for this bill. I am. As you understand it. And you have heard from your constituents back home, this is important to us, this is a priority. Yes. Colonel Schein, when I talked to Speaker Strauss the other day, 
at an event that we put on, I asked him about this. He said, I don't consider this to be an urgent issue. It was not, it sounded to me like one of his priorities, the way it's one of the lieutenant governors. Is it one of yours? Well, first, it's a priority, yes. It Let is. me just say this. Yes. If Donald Trump, as our president, rescinds all of the executive orders that he says he's going to do that President Obama signed, that should take the issue off the table. If the issue continues to persist, there are already bills filed in the Senate and in the House, yep. and we will deal with this issue accordingly. But you, you, as of right now, believe that we do need legislation, nothing changes? Well, not necessarily need, if, if, like I said, if President Trump yep. rescinds the executive orders, then it may not be an issue at all. Right. We don't know that yet, he's right. not president yet, so we're going to have to wait until that happens to see how how that's going to right. uh, translate. Now, you, you talked about economic development as a big priority of yours. You know what happened in North Carolina when this bill passed. North Carolina lost the NCAA Final Four. North Carolina had problems with sports leagues, with concerts. Donald Trump won North Carolina. The Republican governor of North Carolina lost his bid for re-election over this issue. Just as we said, Colonel Shine, two years ago, don't California my Texas. We could be saying two years from now, don't North Carolina my Texas. And I, I'm Do you worry about the economic development? Let me ask him, please. Do you worry about the economic development impact on the state? The Texas Association of Business just assessed potentially $8 billion at risk if well, this bill passed. Texas Association of Business also um, actively is the biggest opponent to banning sanctuary, sanctuary cities in the state. So the business but community I'll, is now liberal, Dr. Buckingham? I'm just saying the Texas Association of Business is the biggest hurdle to us passing sanctu banning sanctuary cities in the state. But let me ask but Colonel Shine, I asked Colonel Shine about on, economic let development. Just, let me just intervene because I, I have had conversations with the Lieutenant Governor that Colonel Shine may not be privy to, that he, his focus is really the schools. And he's going to, my understanding is the, the businesses, the sporting venues, Will, will not be affected by this law. He, his focus is really um, the bathrooms and the schools. Did you just so. make news? Are you telling me that the business community and sporting venues are going to be exempt from the bathroom bill? Well, we'll see what the language looks like, but it's my understanding that that's the intent to realize that there are some complicating factors there and, and our priorities are really the schools. Colonel Shine, to come back to this, do you think that there's an economic development risk to the state of doing this? And is it worth it? I represent Central Texas. We are not going to have an NCAA event in Central Texas, to my knowledge. And, You're going to have uh, one in San Antonio in 2018. The speakers, but I don't represent about this. San Antonio. I represent Bell County. Okay. <laughs> All right. I got it. All right. Every, every man for himself, huh? Is that it? <laughs> oh, those are your words, Evan. Yeah, they, they sure as heck are. Okay. Here we go. Uh, question here. Question there. And we'll go as long as we can till one o'clock, ma'am. Thank you both. Actually, all three of you for being here today. I think this is wonderful uh, for our community. My question as a lifelong member of Bell County is what is your concern and what do you plan to do about the water crisis and shortage here in the state? You've referenced several times about the insurgence of new residents into the state of Texas. And yep. as you know, we have a wonderful lake, Lake Belton, and it's definitely yep. something we want to preserve. And Sure, your uh, Colonel Schein, water was a big issue a couple sessions ago, but of course we passed the SWIFT funding mechanism. The Water Development Board is at work. I'm not sure that it's going to be a big priority, this issue. Should oh, it be? Oh, it's going to be a priority. Should it be? What, it's going to be a priority. In what respect should water be a priority? Well, we can't survive without it, for one right, thing. Right, but, what, but, what, what, yeah, but you, also, you also can't make it rain. So tell me, short of being able to make it well, rain, Well, there may be some folks you, out there who believe you can make, make it rain. rain. Right. Okay. But what, can, mean, what can you do? Here's what we can do. Number one, I've made water one of my most important issues to be working on. And those of you that know, I have uh, participated in water summits across Texas since March. I have employed a full-time intern, uh, when she wasn't going to school, to be working on water issues, to be prepared for this as a priority as well. We have underground water conservation districts across Texas, but we don't have them everywhere across Texas. We have probably the most efficient and most effective underground water control district in the state. In fact, it's so well respected that other water control districts look at the leadership we have so they can go back to their districts and try to build them in the same way. We have got to manage water. The state owns the water on the surface. 
If you're a property owner, you own the water underneath the surface of your, of your land, and it needs to be maintained that way because I am a strong property rights individual. That's your water. We've got to make sure that we are doing everything we can to save water. I've got, a, a, you know, the water availability, and I just, I got a quick note because this one's a little, not complicated, but I, I want to make sure that folks understand water withdrawal is primarily with power companies. All the water consumption is really with power companies on a withdrawal basis. On a consumption basis, however, is with agriculture. Nobody's looked at it from that perspective of trying to balance our water resources as to where it's being withdrawn and who's actually using it. We're studying that because I think that's going to be a very important yeah. part of the process to try to resolve uh, the water issue. You, are you going to make water a budget priority or just a policy priority? It's a policy, but not you know not let, not, not thinking you're going to spend more money toward. No, it's a policy dealing of, with the it's issue. It's a policy initiative. Right. I agree with the swift funds and and you know that there's that joke that whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting, and we've been fighting about water for hundreds of years. Right. But I think the law of the biggest pump is going to be going away. I think we need to get some fairness and equity and property yep. owners' right to capture. So I think you're going to see a big movement to change water policy in the state, okay. sir. I know what you're going to ask. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know. I've, I've got several questions I wanted to ask, but uh, I, I just right, thought, I'd start, one. I just start, thought I'd start asking this one. Yes. Okay. Is this one working? Yeah. All right. Anyway. You exceeded the height requirement, actually. This was going to be on Article 5. Yeah, I figured. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> this is the con yes, con right. Constitutional Convention. Right. Article 5, Constitutional yeah. Convention. Just wanted to say that the fig leaf has been blown away to say that that could ever be a limited uh, convention because in their Article 5, uh, these people that are pushing this thing, in their own practice convention, which was 96% 90, uh, Republican, by the way, ladies right. and gentlemen, I'm sure that won't happen in a real convention, uh, they just demonstrated that it's unlimited. Right. It's Katie bar the door. You open this thing up and the whole Constitution is at risk. So what's your question? So my question is, well, it needed a little preface there, uh, my question is, are you willing to put the Constitution at risk to uh, get some supposed good out of it, which none of the things that are being proposed even would actually do what they're intended to. They'll do 180 degrees the opposite. So I yeah. just wanted to get your opinion. question is, the Constitutional Convention or the Convention of States that Governor Abbott has asked for and their support in the legislature, gentlemen, is right. You can't limit what would be considered as an item to be amended in the Constitution. It's it's wide open. Mm -hmm. So what do you what do you is it worth it? Well, I, I tell you what, and, and Davis, I, I love you dearly, but this is a spot we disagree on. You know, I I'm here to fight against an overreaching federal government and the Convention of States. You know, I think our forefathers were very smart and they realized that the over government, I mean, the federal government was going to have a tendency to overreach, and at some point the states were going to have to stand up and limit the federal government. So I am on board with Lieutenant Governor and Governor Abbott on this, and I'm looking forward to wreaking some havoc and cutting the federal government down to where it should be. But you acknowledge that when you get into a convention, anything is subject to revision. The things you like and the things you don't like. Well, I, I'm not sure about that. And, and seems I, uh, pretty, it seems pretty clear that that is, in fact, the case. Well, I read the, I read the document from the kind of mock convention they had that helped them determine what legislation would be pushed in every state because the states kind of have to agree on the call. And I, I think you can limit the call. I think they stuck pretty well to the topics that they were trying to at the beginning. Um, you know, I think it's a good process. So it's not that you just hated the last federal government run by somebody who you didn't support. You hate the federal government, period, even when your guys are in charge. We, we live in a time when the, when the EPA wants to declare a puddle in your backyard and navigable waterway and make it subject to federal regulation. Not the next EPA, okay. I can assure you. <laughs> I think we may not have one. <laughs> are, are you for this Constitution Convention, Colonel? Well, first let me say... I took an oath 42 years ago as a young lieutenant in the Army to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I don't take oaths lightly, and it's a covenant as far as I'm concerned. I love this nation. I spent 30 years in the military defending it. I believe that we need to have term limits, and I believe we need to have a balanced budget, and I believe that 
there is a process that we may possibly be able to review to get some of the provisions of this Article 5. And I want to see the governor's legislation. I want to see what comes across to the House as well as the Senate. And until we have a bill and until we know what's there, this thing can be written in a number of different ways. I support the concept and the ideology of it because federal government has been run amok and we're all tired. Many are fed up with what we've had to deal with. This is why Donald Trump won the election because people wanted to throw a hand grenade in Washington. And maybe this is our opportunity, if nothing else, to get term limits and yeah. to get a balanced budget. But you amendment. want to see the legislation before you before I you want to see the legislation before I vote on it, and that's my position. Got it, sir. This past year, the uh, guns on campus came in for the universities. This coming year, it's going to come in for the community college. Is this legislation considering repealing that and making our campuses more safe? Are you considering repealing campus carry? I suspect this is going to be a short exchange. <laughs> Dr. Do, Dr. Do, Dr. Buckingham? I uh, respectfully no. Colonel Schein? I support Senator. H have you seen, either of you seen anything since the law has been in effect since August 1st that gives you reason to doubt that the right call was to make campus carry legal? I have not. Have, I, have you? You know, when you have, fr I'm, I, I, I think that what we have, we have, much greater priorities right now to be dealing with with our budget with uh, with education and a number of other issues uh, I would I would want to address those things before we start addressing other second and third tier issues that we've dealt with before in the previous legislation you're not suggesting that Second Amendment issues are second or third no, tier no, issues no, you don't have a death no. mission in the state of Texas do you No, no not at all yeah because what we have done in the past has been significant but we have some crises right now that we're approaching in this next legislative session. Those need to be your priority. I'm sorry? Those are your priorities, those The crises. priorities need to be, when we go into session, this next session, I'm not saying it's not a priority, but we've got to make sure we address the budget, we address public education, right. and the border, our water issues. Those are our priorities right now because that's the livelihood of the, country, of the state and how this state's gonna continue to grow and broaden its tax base economically. Good, sir. in another country, uh, a future father, uh, walks two hours to school every day for an education. Uh, that same child uh, grows up, drops out of high school to take care of his parents. Uh, they're too poor to afford any further education. The father moves to find work. A mother takes care of a child that is just born. The father is not there. father comes back and moves his family to a new country, leaving everything they know behind. Their child grows up, wants to receive an education, graduates from high school. Okay, you take your time. Sorry. That's all right, take your time. This is a tough issue. Go ahead. Okay. The child wants to go to school, finds out that they're undocumented, and then they just ask that you do not repeal what was done in 2001 and 2005, that you allow TASLA to keep, to, keep uh, to be there for these students, that you let them fulfill their dreams. Do not take their ability to receive an education away from them. If you were to repeal TASFA, if you were to repeal their uh, ability to fill out the affidavit for intent to become a permanent resident, uh, that
that would make the education, higher education unavailable to them. That would crush their dreams. These people are my friends. These people are part of my family. I meet with these students in high school. They cry. They talk to me. I go to school with these people in college. Tasfa and this affidavit is what gives them hope. Please do not take that away from me. Thank you for speaking. Th thank and you for it, asking. If I can work with you all in any way to help you understand this issue better, I will do my best to work with you. And I, and my Evans, this is what makes this such a difficult issue. Right. What do you say to that? You say, this is what makes our job so tough in some realms. Right. Because we're talking about people. We're talking about people that have lived here and are part of our society, part of our, live in our neighborhoods. And it makes it really tough. And I don't know what the answer is necessarily. Well, in fact, Colonel Sean, you, you, know? said, you said what the answer was before it was overturn the law. Can I understand that. Can you because explain we, why we Because it the law? violates the law. We're a nation of laws and not of men. We've got to find a solution and that young man is welcome in my office and we will discuss it and we will discuss with other members of the house to try to figure out how we resolve issues like this that affect people that live in our communities. But, but you, you are not moved by what you just heard to have a different, your, your position is your position overturned the law. You know, we're a nation of laws. Dr. Buckingham. I agree, we have to follow the laws we have, so. Sir. Payday and auto title lending is a practice. I'm sorry, say again. Payday and auto title lending is a practice that negatively affects individuals, communities, and families. As a representative from the nonprofit industry, I would like to ask what meaningful reform you'll put forth at the state level at this next legislative session that hasn't been put forth by our state in the years past, Good. especially when 35 cities across the state have passed local ordinances to cover 40% of the Texas population. Payday lending, Colonel Shine, what do you think about that? It's usury. It's usury. It's usury. Yeah. Okay. I'm in the financial services business. Right. It's despicable. So you want to see, the question? It, it, uh, the, the question was what to do about payday lending. Colonel Shine says it's usury. I'm in the financial services it, I'm in industry. The financial services and business. Your and your word was it's despicable. Yeah. Right. So you intend You're to taking do whatever, advantage yeah. of lower social economic individuals who really are not of of the knowledge and understanding of what they're actually getting themselves into. Dr. Buckingham, is payday lending despicable? Well, you know, you have, it's a tough situation because you have some people taking advantage of vulnerable folks, but they need that money at that time in amounts that no one else will lend them. So I think, I think we need to look at it. We need to be sure that the proper protections are in place. Um, so I, not despicable? Well, I think, again, you know, a lot of times you have a basket of apples. So you have some apples that are helping people out when they need it, and you have some apples who are abusing vulnerable people. So okay. you need to ferret that out. I'm being told that we have to end on time, and that is unfortunately 1 o'clock, and we've got to stop right there. Please give Dr. Buckingham and Colonel Shine a good